and let's begin. Good morning, everyone. I'm Camille from Shenard's Nursery. You may have seen me around. Uh, I'm the resident beekeeper here. I do a lot of tree and shrub work, and I'm in the houseplant area as well. I've uh, been here for about three years now, and I'm loving every minute of it. So I'm here to help you understand your houseplants today, your houseplant problems, and how to solve different pests that may or may not be affecting your houseplants. Um, the photos here are just taken of my plants, so you can kind of get a grasp on the types of things that I'm dealing with, um, indoor and outdoor things. You'll see avocados, monstera deliciosas, uh, Cuban oregano, and a couple of different pothos. So common pests covered today, just so you can kind of get a grasp of uh, where I'm coming from here. A uh, couple of fungi, I'm gonna be covering sooty mold, uh, gray mold, also called botrytis, powdery mildew, um, lightly touching on other fungal and disease issues, fungus gnats, aphids, mealybugs, scale bugs, uh, spider mites, that's the bane of my existence right there, and of course, thrips. So tips for pests. Just before we get started, prevention is the absolute easiest way to deal with all of these pests. Healthy plants are much better fighters. They're less attractive to bugs. They're harder for bugs to feed on. Um, so if you have a healthy plant, chances are the plant's going to stay healthy unless something happens to change the balance. It's good to have a quarantine zone for plants that are sick or brand new plants that appear healthy that you've just brought home. You don't wanna bring home a plant from a, a nursery or somewhere else and have it wind up affecting all of your healthy plants. So keep it in a quarantine zone for, for the first week or two and just make sure that everything's healthy. When you lay eyes on your plants every day, make sure you see them in an area where you at least glance at them every day. You can see changes from day to day, whether or not they stay healthy, whether they start to droop, whether they start to yellow or change color or change in any way. It's always easiest to catch problems early on. And some pests are quite small, so it's always ha handy to have a hand lens around. This one actually has a light on it. Unfortunately, the battery is dead, but you get the point. Um, physical efforts should always be employed first. This is easiest on the plant, and a lot of people don't like dealing with chemicals, so try physical first. A lot of times it can help, especially if you catch things early. Um, you can change the watering schedule, certain soil-dwelling pests, um, can actually be weighted out. Um, when you wait to water your plant, most of your pests are going to die off before your plant starts showing negative effects from lack of water. This isn't always the case, um, but for fungus gnats in particular, you can usually just dry them out and fix the problem. Always remove all rotting organic materials, so dropped flowers, dead leaves, things like this that can provide easy food and shelter for pests. You'll want to utilize your quarantine zone, like I mentioned before, to prevent other plants from being infected um, and physically remove pests before treating. So Q-tips, believe it or not, are a wonderful tool to have in your arsenal. Um, the shower head, um, also just the spout in your sink or for particularly nasty pests with really tough leaved plants, you can actually hose them off in the yard as well. Uh, consistency for treatment is vital, particularly when you're using chemicals. You want to break the pest life cycle and continue to have it broken. If you kill all of the adults of a specific pest and then say, oh, well, the adults are dead, everything's fine. You still have nymphs in the soil. You haven't actually solved your problem. So continue treating even after the pests seem like they're gone to make sure that that life cycle is broken. And keep a good eye on recovering plants because it is possible for them to be reinfected even if you've done everything right. So common indicators of pests. Uh, like I said, just keep an eye on your plants every day. Uh, you may see a sudden just kind of overall sadness, drooping, yellowing leaves, fading leaves, spotting, uh, curling leaves, deformed new growth, or kind of like a, a dusty sooty mold. Um, this isn't going to happen overnight, but you'll see a gradual change, and this is a good indicator. Uh, this plant here is uh, our very own Angelique Calders. She uh, inherited it, and it had some bug problems, and as you can see in the forward-facing photo, it's a little sad, it's kind of discolored, it's just not really happy. 
After she's treated it for a couple of weeks, it's made a full recovery and looks wonderful. Is it really a pest? Uh, a pest meaning um, an, in an insect disease or some sort of fungal infestation. There are several physiological factors that may look like pests, but aren't necessarily caused by something that you can just treat with a chemical or a, a physical. Um, inconsistent over and under watering are the most common cause of basically everything in the houseplant world. Um, you'll see leaf tip burn, drooping, deformed or melted new growth, particularly when you're over watering. Uh, root rot as well. When you go to transplant your plant, instead of having these nice full roots, you're going to pull up just a stem. And at that point, it's usually a little too late. Uh, catch these, these top things first, the leaf burn, the drooping, and the deformed new growth. Transport and transplant shock can definitely cause some issues as well. It may look like pest damage, wait it out for a little while, keep an eye on it, see if it changes for the better or for the worse. Um, new humidity, light, and watering patterns can definitely cause shock. Um, this Monstera albo, for example, has some transport shock issues and a little bit of a, a watering change issue. This is an older leaf, which is actually planted slightly below the soil, and eventually it will probably fall off. All of the new growth on this plant is astoundingly healthy. It's doing great. It just had a little bit of uh, transport shock. Uh, physical tissue from branches or leaves being pinched or smashed are pretty common too. You'll see little tears or bunches. Um, always good to put your house plants in an area where you're not going to be brushing past them very often or pets can't get to them. Uh, physical deformities when plants grow into or through objects can look like cupping from pests as well. Uh, Monstera Adensoni is atrocious as far as this goes. It'll grow through any little holes in ceramic dishes, all sorts of things it shouldn't be growing through. And it does cause odd deformities with the leaves. Old leaves as well can look like over or under watering. It can look like pest damage. The old leaves will tend to yellow and kind of shrivel a little bit and then fall off. But the older leaves as they get older and dustier and just less effective photosynthesis uh, from a photosynthesis standpoint, it is more productive for the plant to create a new leaf and drop that old leaf. So perfectly normal, nothing wrong with old leaves falling off. Moving on to the actual pests here, we're going to start with sooty mole, which isn't necessarily a pest in itself, but it is a very common indicator. Uh, sooty mold can be caused by several different pests. Some pests make more sooty mold than others, but it's an awesome indicator and it's something that's not going to permanently damage your plant in most cases. Um, the fungus cannot grow on the plant itself. It needs food in order to grow. And so what the pests do to enable the growth of sooty mold is the pests are eating the sugars of the plant and excreting honeydew or basically sugary uh, past poop, and then the fungus grows on that, which alerts the house plant owner to take care of the pest problem. The leaves will look kind of dusty and speckled, but usually, in a mild case, you can just wipe it off the leaf with a cloth or with your finger. Uh, the sooty mold doesn't actually harm the plant unless you've got an infestation so crazy that it's going to disrupt photosynthesis, and at that point, the sooty mold is still the least of your worries. So clean the sooty mold off once you've treated and watch for its return. This is an easy indicator that your pests are still there and you need to continue treatment. Botrytis. This is most typical on outdoor plants, but it does occur inside from time to time. This is botrytis on a flower of Camellia sinensis, the tea camellia. And uh, as you can see here, it's quite a bit denser than your sooty mold, also called gray mold, um, but it, it's kind of spotty, it's thick, and it will poof. You can actually see all of the spores coming off of it when you touch it, so it spreads very easily. You need to be kind of careful with this one. Um, the mold in this case is actually the pest itself rather than an indicator, and it will kill the flowers. It will uh, disrupt pollination, make it so seeds do not appear, it's, it's basically better just to keep this away. 
Um, the most common causes of botrytis are uh, humidity, already sick plants being susceptible to it. Greenhouse conditions are absolutely perfect for the growth of botrytis. Um, so we try and treat these right away, clear away any material that you see with uh, botrytis affecting it. Chemical controls and physical controls are um, usually effective on this as long as you can catch it early. Neem is a very mild um, fungicide, so you can use this early on. Um, a more advanced progression like you see here, I would remove this bud entirely and actually treat it with a Monterey disease control or in an outdoor setting, um, a heavier fungicide like a copper fungicide or um, a fungino. <clears throat> Excuse me. Powdery mildew. This is also more common outside than inside, but it will occur inside, particularly if you have outdoor plants affected by it and animals running around going back into the house. Thank you, cat. Um, so powdery mildew is pretty obvious once it manifests. You see this bottom leaf here is completely covered and needs to be removed and destroyed. Um, it's much finer than either of the other two molds that I've, that I've discussed. And it's usually starting off spotty and then becoming a very large coating. The turnaround on this is about three days. So when you're treating, you're going to need to continue treating continue taking off all of those old dead leaves that you can't save and make sure that the new growth is infected. The new growth is what you're saving when you're seeing really severe cases like this. Green Cure is a great chemical control for it. It's also safe for pets and people. Um, it's, it's basically baking soda mixed with water. Very gentle, very effective. Neem can be effective, but again, it's a very mild fungicide. So you're gonna have to catch it early. Same with milky water. You're gonna use about a one-to-one -one ratio of milk and water in a spray bottle and spray each side of the leaf, all affected areas, once every two to three days. Monterey disease control is also effective with this kind of thing. Um, broad fungal and disease issues. This can get complicated and we certainly don't have enough time to cover all fungal and disease issues for all these different plants. Depending on the plant that you uh, are talking about here, there can be many different diseases and fungi that target only a specific plant. Uh, for instance, a Hoya can have a Hoya specific disease, where if you have other plants surrounding it, they cannot contract it because it is Hoya specific. Or you can have uh, more broad diseases that can affect your entire house plant array. Um, an easy way to track these things down is you can go to Pacific Northwest Plant Management Handbooks. Um, it's a great online resource as long as you know what plant you're dealing with and you can kind of pinpoint what's going on with it. Um, it will show you photos of the plants, photos of the disease, and then it will tell you how to treat these certain things. So definitely worth a look there. Um, when you're dealing with fungal issues and disease issues, Severely diseased leaves aren't going to come back, so you'll need to remove those and destroy them. Make sure that you're not just putting them in a trash can in the same room with your house plants because then that can still spread in most cases. Um, Monterey disease control and Captain Jack's copper fungicides uh, are usually good for indoors. They help slow and stop disease as long as they're caught quickly. Um, you want to be kind of careful with things like this. The copper fungicide in particular will stain so use it outdoors, use it in a bathtub, somewhere where you're not going to be worried about staining. The Monterey disease control, the spinosad here, is a lot easier to use and isn't quite as bad as far as staining goes. Fungus gnats. If you haven't seen fungus gnats, you probably don't have that many houseplants. They're incredibly common. They are also incredibly annoying but luckily they aren't hugely detrimental to most houseplants. Fungus nests, um, they're a lot easier to see in large numbers. An individual gnat is so small, it's almost microscopic. So when you touch your plant a little bit, kind of uh, move the pot, you'll see a little cloud rising up from the pot, just full of fungus nests. 
that's usually a pretty bad case. Um, it's pretty typical. You move your pot, you'll see five or six of them. When you're seeing a cloud, that's a pretty bad infestation and does need to be treated. But in most cases, it's just an annoyance. So fungus gnats are interesting because they aren't just on the leaves, they're more of a soil pest. So the eggs and the, the larva are going to be in the soil of the plant, and then they rise as adults, and they don't really eat anything as adults, they just procreate and then move back down into the soil. So you have this cycle in and out of the soil of the plant, which means you're going to have to treat the soil of the plant. Um, the gnat larvae typically don't do much damage, but in very severe cases, they can munch on the root hairs, which will eventually inhibit the plant from uptaking uh, nutrients, and it can start to look a little bit sad. Um, sticky white traps for adult stages are pretty effective. These will cover the soil and be incredibly sticky. Your adults are going to come down in order to lay their eggs and get stuck instead. This isn't going to eradicate your population, but it is going to drastically reduce it. And that's gonna make it easier to treat. Diatomaceous earth for adults emerging from soil is effective, but it's kind of a pain to deal with. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later as we get into the physical controls and chemi chemical controls portion of the class. Um, BT and spinosad for larval stages are quite effective as well. You use that as a spray, you spray the top of the soil. As they emerge, they're going to be hit by that and they won't actually be able to breathe. So that will stop their life cycle as well. Mosquito bits are possibly the most effective way to deal with fungus gnats, and they're the easiest to apply. So you've just got this little bag of bits, you sprinkle it on top of the soil, and they're kind of ugly, so you sprinkle a little bit of soil on top of them, and then this will take care of all of your fungus snap problems. Neem spray on the leaves can help with the adult stage as well, as long as you keep up on that, make sure there are no adults procreating, that can also help with your problem. Moving on to aphids. I'm sure everyone has encountered these in their lives. Um, most typical on outdoor plants, but we certainly see them indoors from time to time and they are hugely annoying and they also do quite a bit of damage to the plants. Um, unfortunately, pets love to bring aphids in. So if you have indoor outdoor animals, make sure to brush them off during peak season, particularly in the late summer as they can definitely bring aphids into your house plants as well. You see a, a raptophora down here with some aphids in it. Um, you see discoloration of the leaves, kind of curling, cupping of the leaves as well as the aphids are affecting the leaves. Uh, this photo up here to the left is kind of interesting. You see lots of aphid skeletons, not very many live aphids. And if you'll notice this little growth up here, that's where a ladybug has hatched and had its feast. So uh, a, a benefit for outdoor, but a little difficult for indoor. When you're dealing with aphids indoors, physical controls can be very effective. Uh, spray the plant hard with water, get all of the aphids knocked off of the plant. Pinch the adults when you see a couple of them clinging on. It's kind of gross, but it is very effective, especially if you've got a plant that's easy to see all of the leaf surfaces. Um, your chemical controls, neem is very effective for aphids, mealybug destroyer as well. We're going to go over this a little bit later, but we do have a special recipe uh, that Andrea Chenard has come up with here, and it works wonders and stays in solution for a long time. It's one of my favorite things to use. On to mealybugs. If you've seen these things, you know how painful they can be. They'll affect a very wide range of plants. And they basically just look like fuzzes. They look like you dropped a piece of Q-tip onto your plant. Only they're a lot more dangerous than Q-tips. Um, they're also very difficult to treat because they have chemical resistant skin on them. They, they've got kind of a shield. Um, so the needle-like mouth parts of these mealybugs are longer than the bodies. They insert their tongue straight into plant and they begin to suck up all the sugar from the plant. They eat quite a bit. As you can tell in this photo here, the waste, um, the honeydew, 
which attracts sooty mold, kind of ends up everywhere. Um, not all mealybug species have males. Some of them are strictly female. But if you do see a species of mealybug where there are males, the males are kind of interesting. They uh, look like gnats, but they do have the white tails of the mealybugs. So that's your identifying characteristic there. The males aren't really an issue. So if you're seeing a male, the only trouble that he really causes is by procreation. Um, mealybug destroyers and physical removal with Q-tips. And mealybug destroyer from isopropyl alcohol, quite effective here. The mealybug destroyer, as you see in this top photo on the left, looks just like a mealybug, but it's larger and it kind of looks wet. It's also incredibly mobile. Your, your actual mealybugs are going to be mainly stationary unless they're very young. Only the young ones move, the older ones will stay fixed to the same spot. Your mealybug destroyers are very quick. So if you see these guys around, it's okay to keep them. They're gonna help you out. As far as chemical destroyer or chemical controls, like I mentioned, um, the mealybug destroyer spray is very effective. We also have a spray oil, which is used. I've got my spray oil, spray oil right here. All seasons but the spray oil is used in the mealybug destroyer as well. And that will suffocate uh, the mealybug. That chemical resistant shield becomes clogged and then it cannot breathe through its skin. Scale are very close cousins of mealybugs, but they are even less mobile. Uh, the zoomed in photo here, you can see that this adult uh, female scale has actually fused her scale to the leaf. So she will not move again in her lifetime. Um, they have uh, the same waxy chemical resistant shield. So that makes them difficult to see. They almost look like a fungal issue, but they are actually an insect. Um, let's see. Uh, difficult to control. The, the, waxy, the waxy skin on them makes them resistant to most chemicals. So if you're using... Um, and see your, your neem and things like that. They're just not really going to get through that shield. You really need some kind of an oil or an isopropyl alcohol in order to get through to your scale. The sooty mold with Hoyas, or sorry, with Hoyas, with scale is particularly prevalent. So you're really going to be looking for that in these cases. And the sooty mold is not always going to look the same. Sometimes it's going to look kind of dusty and light colored. In this case, we've got kind of a dark colored sooty mold. So they're not all the same. Spider mites. This is potentially my least favorite pest. It's treatable, but the problem is these mites are so small that you usually don't detect them until you have a really bad case. And then it does require quite a bit of treatment in order to get the population under control. There are several species of spider mites. The two most common spider mite species you're going to find in your houseplants are going to be the top photo here, the two spot white spider mite. And these are spider mites that create very large webs. This alocasia leaf right here is about three feet long. So that's an indicator of just how webbed this leaf is. Um, the red spider mites are the other very common spider mite you're going to see on your houseplants, and they are so small, you really do need a hand lens in order to see them. Usually, calatheas are the, the top picks for these spider mites. They are very susceptible, and it's very hard to see until you have such a large population that you really need to get on top of that. Sorry. Um, a high pressure water bath will knock most of your mites off. You will still need to treat after this, but this is going to help knock your population down to a more manageable level. You will need to remove severely infected leaves because at some point the powder, uh, the, the mildew becomes so bad um, that the leaves are pockmarked in a way that they aren't going to recover. They're not going to be able to photosynthesize. So just cut those leaves back and then they will grow new healthy leaves. Your chemical, chemical controls for spider mites are pretty broad. 
You can use the mealybug destroyer, which is pretty effective. You can use neem sprays. Um, make sure you get full coverage on the upper and the lower side of the leaves. Just because you don't see them on a leaf does not mean they're not there. Like I said, they're incredibly small and hard to see. So when you are treating for spider mites, treat every part of the plant. Leave no leaf unturned. Thrips, typically pretty uncommon in houseplants, but uh, sometimes seen. Usually you're gonna see these on outdoor flowers. Roses are particularly bad. Um, thrips are very small. They're kind of difficult to see unless they're actually moving, um, but they can bite. So there, there's something right there that you can identify them by. Usually um, adults are small oblong black dots. They can also be kind of a greenish color. The damage is usually pretty more, uh, a little more visible than the insect pets itself. So look for yellowing leaves, boring patterns, kind of stripey things. Um, thrips are kind of like grasshoppers. They've got long legs, they do jump quite a bit. And when you see them on your plants, you're going to treat the adult or the larval stages or a combination thereof. Diatomaceous earth, which we'll get into a little bit later, is a good physical control as long as you apply it often and you apply it correctly. Sticky traps are another effective control. Um, set them on top of your soil so that when the thrips come down to lay their eggs in the soil, they are trapped instead. This doesn't solve the problem, but it will um, reduce your population so that you can control it easier. There are chemical controls. Because you're treating the larval stages, spinosad and Bt um, are going to be used in the soil. Neem, you can spray on the leaves for the adult stage. There's also a special neem drench that you can use for the larval stage. So uh, um, so we've talked a little bit about the pests themselves, uh, the plants that they can affect, and where they will hang out on the plants. I'm gonna go over chemical controls. So we've got the, the bug part and then we've got the control part. So hopefully that'll make sense for everybody. Uh, first and foremost, chemical or physical controls, and then move on to your chemicals. The physical controls are going to control your population. Hopefully you can just use the physical control for a minor population and then that will be enough. But in some cases you do need to really turn to the chemicals as well. So spray pests off with water. You can do this outside or inside as long as you've got a good area where you can really clean them off. Um, uh, prevent pests from emerging from the soil with chemical or with physical controls. Diatomaceous earth can really help with that and create a physical barrier. And uh, sticky paper can prevent adults from laying eggs in the soil. So when I'm saying spray with water, I don't mean spritz it with your, your spray bottle. I mean, really get some pressure going on here. Depending on your plant, you may be able to apply more or less pressure. Um, a hose on jet setting, great for a lot of outdoor plants, but that's going to actually damage some of your indoor plants, so be kind of careful if you're going to go this route. A kitchen sink sprayer is particularly effective, um, especially if you, you've got um, more tender house plants, you can usually adjust the pressure and just kind of do kind of a gentle spray there. Uh, for large plants that you can't get to the sink, if you can figure out how to move them into the shower, the shower head works wonders as well, and then all of your pests go straight down the drain. Uh, this physical control is effective against most pests that are somewhat mobile. Um, spider mites, aphids, and thrips. This will get rid of the bulk of your population, and if you still see some lingering population, you can move on to chemical controls at a later point. Sticky traps, as the name implies, they're, they're basically really sticky pieces of paper. Nothing particularly special about them, but sometimes they do contain pheromones specific to the pest mentioned, aphid and white fly, for instance. Um, you lay the traps on top of the soil, sticky side up, and then after a couple of days, you'll see that there are lots of different flying pests stuck to that. Change them out as you need, and eventually you're not going to see any pests on here. Um, when I say sticky, I mean they're insanely sticky. So don't let your hair get stuck in there. It's really not fun. <laughs> so these are effective against highly mobile pests and pests that move from 
your leaf mass to your soil. Fungus gnats, thrips, and aphids are the, the best things to control with this. Diatomaceous earth. Um, a lot of people use this and it can be very effective, but it can be a little difficult to use and kind of obnoxious in my opinion. Um, diatomaceous earth is a powder formed of finely ground shells. So it's soft when you lift it with your fingers, doesn't hurt you, doesn't hurt your animals, but at a microscopic level, those shells are incredibly sharp and pests cannot handle that. You'll apply a fine dusting, about a half an inch thick to your soil. Make sure all soil is completely covered. There are no cracks. And then as your eggs become um, larva and then become adult stages, they're going to try and go through that. And then these insects are going to be cut up. Their wings aren't going to function properly. They're not going to live long enough to reproduce and they're eventually going to die off. The downside is you have to reapply the diatomaceous earth after each watering. Um, if you can imagine cracks in a dried up desert lake, this is kind of what happens when you water the top of diatomaceous earth. So you're going to have to reapply that every single time you water until the pests go away. It is very effective if you keep up on it for fungus gnats and thrips in particular. Moving on to chemicals. Um, my go-to is the mealy bug destroyer, uh, just rubbing, rubbing alcohol, horticultural oil. Even if you don't use it often, it stays in solution quite well. You can use it in any bottle you want. I usually use uh, just your typical 12 ounce sprayer here. And we'll get into more detail in the coming slides. The mealybug destroyer, you can use whatever isopropyl alcohol you feel or you have handy. We use 70%, that's all you really need. Um, stronger isopropyl alcohol isn't going to hurt. So what you're going to do is you're going to spray a liberal coating on all affected leaf surfaces. Make sure to spray the undersides of the leaves, the stems, any crevices. Um, most pests are going to really like to hang out in crevices that are really protected. So you have to make sure that you get a really good coating and you make sure to get all of these little hidey holes. Um, use about once a week for three weeks and this covers the majority of your pest life cycles. This will break the pest life cycle and then it will break it some more. Um, the best thing about this combination here is it's very gentle. It can often be used without harming the plant. The isopropyl alcohol um, evaporates quickly, it kills on contact, and your spray oil isn't going to harm the plant either, but it's going to suffocate anything that has a, a that protective coating like your mealybugs and your scale. Another cool thing, it also doubles as a leaf shine. Once you use it, your houseplant is going to look great. Um, effective on mealybug scale, spider mites, aphids, and quite a few other pests out there as well, but trying to keep it simple for now. Neem, um, organic, gentle, a lot of people know what this is. A lot of people have been using it outdoors for quite some time, works wonderfully indoors as well. It is a very effective miticide and pesticide. It can be used as a fungicide in mild cases. Uh, for heavy fungal infections, you're probably going to want to upgrade to something else. And this comes in a concentrate, a ready to use or a pure oil. Note that if you're using the pure oil though, it's not going to stay in concentration unless you use an emulsifier. Dawn dish soap works great, kind of a pain in the butt to use. So I usually get the concentrate of the Rose RX. And same deal with the Millie Bug Destroyer. As with the neem, make sure to apply a liberal coating on all affected leaf surfaces, undersides of leaves, stems, any cracks or crevices. Um, you're going to apply this once every seven to 14 days until pests are no longer appearing. This is effective on most adult stage insects, mites, and fungus. So aphids, spider mites, thrips, fungus gnats. In mild cases, it can help with powdery mildew and botrytis as well. Pyrethrin. Um, your concentrated pyrethrin is technically OMRI certified organic. 
The ready to use has a non-essential ingredient that uh, isn't technically organic. So if you're looking for organic, make sure to get your concentrate and mix it yourself. Um, it's derived from the pyrethrum daisy. Um, a little more effective than neem. So if you have a worse pest problem and you know that you need to do something fast and you need to do something very effective right now, I would go straight to the pyrethrum. This, this is pulling out your big guns right here. You use it the exact same way, apply once every 14 days, make sure to cover all affected surfaces, undersides of leaves are important. And it's going to take care of all of the same pests, your spider mites, your aphids, your thrips, your scale, your mealybugs, and your fungus mites. Spray oil. These are particularly effective with scale and mealybugs and things that have that really tough chemical resistant uh, shell. This is um, suffocant. So it only works on contact. You have to make sure that you spray every single part of the plant in order to get any pest that you may have missed. If you don't spray the pest with it, it's not going to stick on there and eventually take care of the pest later. It has to hit the pest when you're spraying it or it doesn't work. Um, so like I said, it's a suffocant. So it will clog the pores of the mite or the insect and it will prevent it from breathing through its skin. Uh, BT, Bacillus thuricide, and Spinosad. They come in concentrate, ready to use, and granular as mosquito bits. And we talked about mosquito bits before, just go a little granules here. Um, as far as a liquid application, you're going to spray a liberal coating on all affected leaf surfaces. Uh, I feel like a little bit of a, a broken record here. Make sure to spray the undersides of your leaves. The mosquito bits are really easy to apply. Just sprinkle them onto the soil. Um, too much or too little is kind of a, a loose topic, so as, as much as you really need in there. Don't, don't go overboard, but it doesn't matter if you do a handful or two. Um, cover loosely with additional soil. They do look a little bit ugly once they swell after the plant has been watered, so toss some soil on top of that. This will control fungus gnats, thrips, mosquitoes, and caterpillars, particularly things in the larval stages that have very soft skin. Um, Monterey disease control and copper fungicide. Usually copper fungicide is used outdoors, mainly because it stains and uh, as a preventative, but it is a very effective fungicide and can be used indoors with caution. Uh, Monterey disease control, I actually use this indoors all the time. Really easy to mix, stays in solution just fine. Um, both of these are organic, they're very effective. Uh, more effective than neem when you're dealing with uh, uh, fung fungal problems. With either product, you're going to spray all parts of the plant heavily. Again, don't forget the undersides of the leaves. You wanna get a good coverage. Um, usually you're going to spray weekly until symptoms subside, but definitely check the label. Uh, there are certain houseplants that are more sensitive than others and check the label to make sure your houseplant isn't marked as please don't use this or make sure your houseplant is marked or use this concentration. There, there are a lot of interesting uh, details on there that you do want to make sure you're reading. Um, you can treat powdery mildew, botrytis, black spot, leaf spots, rust, anaphrocos, and bacterial leaf blights. These are just to name a few. There are so many out there. Um, and I think that's just about all I have for you today as far as the lecture. Um, thanks everyone for joining. And I'd like to invite everyone to unmute your microphones ask some questions. I'm going to pull up the chat window here and see what you've got for me. Let's see. Bonnie, I've got an old lilac bush whose leaves were affected by mildew all summer. Um, it was let go, but the leaves are picked up now. What should we do this winter and spring? So we all had issues with fungal uh, problems this year outdoors. Um, did you see anything besides the leaves affected? Or was it just the leaves that have already dropped off?
just the leaves? Okay. So in some cases, because it's a deciduous, a deciduous bush, it, uh, it's fine. The, the trunk is gonna be ha having all of its nutrients saved up. It's gonna push new growth in the spring and it should be okay. Um, in this case, I would probably recommend using uh, your copper fungicide as a preventative. Make sure there are no spores left over. And in the springtime, you should have some healthy leaves. The thing about the copper fungicide using it outdoors is you wanna make sure that you're using it um, in a time where it's going to be kind of dry. It can be a little bit difficult this time of year but you want a minimum of about uh, 36 hours of no rain when you're gonna be using this stuff. Do we have any other questions? All right, well, I think this concludes the class for today. Uh, thanks everyone.